Hi everyone, my name is Gevik, I'm your TA, and today we're going to be discussing much of the blood supply to the brain involving the circle of Willis, along with the ventricles, and as well as the dural sinuses and much of the dura mater. So to begin with, much of the blood supply to the brain actually begins from the common carotid artery as well as the subclavian artery, with the common carotid artery actually leading up and becoming the internal carotid artery as well as the external carotid artery and the subclavian artery giving rise to the vertebral arteries. Focusing on these two major systems, we have the common carotid artery, which I mentioned initially. As I mentioned, it gives rise to the external carotid artery, which then goes on to feed much of the facial region, but also the internal carotid artery, which is what we want to focus on here today, is what goes on and actually feeds the brain. And what you'll see is eventually it'll give rise to the three cerebral arteries, the anterior, middle, and the posterior cerebral arteries. But with the vertebral arteries, if you remember, that was that second branch, that actually gives rise to much of the cerebellar arteries. So much of the blood supply that feeds the cerebellum as well as the brainstem. So the internal carotid artery actually feeds into what is known as the circle of Willis. Now the circle of Willis has two main exit points. One, the anterior cerebral artery, and two being the posterior cerebral artery. Now what I want you to remember is, again, this internal carotid artery is what goes on and feeds these cerebral arteries. That's separate from the cerebellar arteries, which we'll encounter later. So for the circle of Willis, there are five main points you'll need to remember. One being the fact that the internal carotid artery is what feeds into the circle of Willis. Next to the exits, the anterior cerebral artery and the posterior cerebral artery, which I already mentioned. And finally, the two communicating arteries. So we have what is known as the anterior communicating artery, which actually connects the two anterior cerebral arteries. And we also have what is the posterior communicating arteries. There are also portions of the cerebral vasculature which aren't part of the circle of Willis, but are important for you to remember. One being the middle cerebral artery. And another is the anterior choroidal artery. Now they may seem like they are as part of the circle of Willis, but they are actually by definition not considered to be part of the five pieces that make up the circle of Willis. Next are more of the cerebellar arteries, those that are feeding the cerebellum as well as much of the brainstem. So we have the superior cerebellar artery, the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, as well as the basilar artery and the pontine arteries. So focusing on the cerebral arteries, these are the arteries that feed into the cerebrum. We have first the anterior cerebral artery. That's the artery that feeds into the midline of the brain and covers much of what is the medial aspect of the frontal lobes as well as the most anterior portion of your parietal lobes. Next, we have the middle cerebral artery. And that's what actually goes out and covers much of the lateral aspects of the lobe. So that covers much of your frontal lobe, your parietal lobe, as well as your temporal lobe. The key distinction here is to remember that the anterior cerebral artery covers midline and the middle cerebral artery covers much of the lateral aspect of the cerebrum. Next we have our anterior choroidal artery and as you can see from the slide that supplies much of what is your anterior medial temporal lobe uh, covering aspects of the optic tract, some portions of the basal ganglia. Finally we have our posterior cerebral artery. That's what actually covers much of the posterior aspect of the brain, as well as the inferior. So covering most of the occipital lobe and many of those inferior regions of the brain. So moving away from the cerebrum, we have much of what covers the cerebellum as well as the brainstem. Now to begin with the cerebellum, we have first the superior cerebellar artery. Now as the name suggests, it covers much of the superior aspect of the cerebellum. Next, we have our two inferior cerebellar arteries. First being the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, which covers and supplies most of what is the anterior inferior portion of the cerebellum, as well as the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, which covers the inferior posterior section of the cerebellum. Next, what we have is the basilar artery, which has branches that come off and are known as the pontine arteries because they feed much of the pons. And finally, we have the anterior spinal artery, which feeds much of the caudal aspects of the brainstem. So just to review the cerebral vasculature, we have what is known as the circle of Willis and its main five components being the internal carotid artery, the anterior cerebral artery, 
the anterior communicating artery, the posterior communicating artery, and finally the posterior cerebral artery. And we have what is considered to be outside of the circle of Willis, which includes much of the basilar artery, the vertebral arteries, the cerebellar arteries, as well as the middle cerebral artery. So looking a little more closely at the vasculature that feeds the brain, we can see there are distinct differences from that which feeds the brain versus the blood vessels which feed the periphery. Now, the blood vessels in the brain are surrounded by what's known as the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is composed of endothelial cells that form the capillary walls. Now these, with the astrocytic end feet, form tight junctions. And these tight junctions serve to allow only the passage of water, some gases, and lipid-soluble molecules by way of passive diffusion. Now also in the blood-brain barrier are pericytes. And these pericytes contain transporters that only selectively transport molecules like oxygen, glucose, or other amino acid-based molecules. Eventually, certain contents from your vasculature become filtered and enter what is known as the ventricles. Now, the ventricles are filled with cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. And this CSF actually results from content filtered from the vasculature that passes through the choroid plexus and enters the ventricles. Now, three reasons to keep in mind why we actually have ventricles is one, it's a form of protection. So in case there is any form of blunt drama, there is at least a cushion for the brain. Next, buoyancy. Now it's immersed in cerebrospinal fluid, like I mentioned. So that reduces the net weight of the brain. And finally, chemical stability. This CSF actually distributes much of its content, which includes ions and other chemicals into the extracellular space for cells to function. So regarding the passage of CSF through the ventricles, we have first the lateral ventricle, which, pa which passes CSF to the third ventricle through what is known as the foramen of Monroe. From the third ventricle, it goes to the fourth ventricle, passing through what is known as the cerebral aqueduct. And finally, it exits out into cisterns from the foramen of Lushka, as well as the foramen of Magendi. Now looking at the different parts of the ventricles themselves, we have focusing on the lateral ventricles. We have the anterior horns, we have the posterior horns, and we also have the inferior horns. Now how to remember that? The anterior horns are part of the anterior brain, posterior part of the posterior brain, and the inferior we find on the inferior portion of the brain. Then we have the third ventricle, which is in the middle, and we can see that connection from both sides, from the foramen of Monroe, connecting the lateral ventricle to the third ventricle. Finally, from the third ventricle, it flows down the cerebral aqueduct and into the fourth ventricle, which feeds out from the foramen of Lushka as well as the foramen of Magendi. Foramen of Lushka's are lateral, foramen of Magendi is medial. So now what we're going to talk about are the dural reflections. And we mentioned the meninges, and there are three, mainly the dura mater, the arachnoid, and the pia. But what we're going to focus on here right now is the dura. So we're going to use this model here to sort of go over things. First, what we want to talk about is the fox cerebri. So the so cerebri is referring to the cerebrum, and it's really this wall right, that we call the Fox cerebri that se separates the two hemispheres of the cerebrum. So after that, what we want to pay attention to is the tentorium cerebelli. So tentorium, in the wo word itself, you can hear the word tent, right? That's literally what it's doing. It's tenting the cerebellum, hence the tentorium cerebelli. And that's ro located right at the base, at the end of the Fox cerebri. After that, we want to talk about the diaphragm celli. It's kind of hard to see here, but uh, the diaphragm celli is just this dura tissue that surrounds the infundibular stalk, which is exactly where the pituitary gland hangs out of. After that, we have the tentorial notch. So we mentioned the tentorial, tentorium cerebelli. Underneath that, if we remove this, you'll find the tentorial notch. Uh, finally, we have what is known as the fox cerebelli. So we, we talked about the fox cerebri, which separates the two hemispheres of the cerebrum. Uh, 
Now we have the Fox Cerebelli, which is actually in here, and it serves the same purpose, separates two hemispheres, but of the cerebellum instead of the cerebrum. So within these dura, what you'll find is actually the dural sinuses. So going back to the ventricles, we mentioned how CSF flows from the lateral ventricle all the way down to the fourth and eventually exits through the foramen of Lushka and the foramen of Magendi. Now, where does, this, where does the CSF really go? It actually enters the subarachnoid space. So the subarachnoid space is that uh, area that's filled with blood vessels right between the pia and the arachnoid matter. Now, why that matters here is eventually that CSF is going to flow within the subarachnoid space and exit, and you'll go over this more in lecture, through these regions called the arachnoid villi. And clusters of these villi together are called granulations, so arachnoid granulations. Now the CSF actually seeps through those regions and enters what's known as the superior sagittal sinus. And the superior sagittal sinus, if you look, is actually in the superior aspect of the fox cerebri. After that, we have the inferior sagittal sinus as well, which is on the inferior section of the fox cerebri. And also, we have what's known as the occipital sinus, and that occipital sinus actually, in its name, it comes from the occipital lobe, so it's more inward, more inferior in the brain. And we also have the straight sinus. So the straight sinus is what connects the inferior uh, sagittal sinus to what's known as the confluence of sinuses. So the confluence of sinuses is this region at the back of the brain where the superior sagittal sinus, the straight sinus, and the occipital sinus actually meet. And they form what's called a confluence, right? You can imagine, you can remember the word conference for just, the con just where they congregate. So what happens from there is this confluence actually separates into the two transverse sinuses. And transverse, you can remember transverse cut into the brain, it's on a transverse plane, and those eventually go down the sigmoidal sinuses, right, that are more S-shaped, hence sigmoidal, and they enter the jugular vein and are returned back to the periphery. So that's what you want to remember. Straight sinus feeds into confluence, inferior sagittal sinus feeds into the straight sinus first, and then the confluence, the occipital sinus feeds into the confluence, and then that drains eventually to the jugular veins. So what we're going to do now is transition back to the brain vasculature and I'm going to show you how to make this handy dandy circle of Willis model that's going to be very helpful for you when you're studying and coming to understand the vasculature of the brain itself. So you can follow along at home if you have pipe cleaners hopefully. So what it's going to take to make this model, this is what it's going to look like in the end, is of course pipe cleaners, right? And what I have here is about six pipe cleaners. So we're going to use one for the circle of Willis, one for the anterior cerebral artery, one for the middle cerebral artery, one for the posterior cerebral artery. And uh, this I'm going to be using for the cere cerebellar arteries as well as this one. So I'm going to be cutting them. You'll see as we go. And of course, you need scissors to cut. So, so to begin with step one, follow along. These are in your slides. You're just going to take one. We'll take one of these pipe cleaners. I'll probably take this black one just because it's easier to see. This black one. And what we're going to do is we're just going to twist it, form a little circle of Willis, right? Like a little ribbon. And I'm going to start twisting these two legs. So by twisting, what I'm creating is the basilar artery as well as what are the two vertebral arteries that feed into the basilar artery. So now we have this, we have our circle of Willis. And where that exactly fits in the brain is actually, if you had this brain model at home, it fits just over this chiasm. So if it's just over and this is just for you to be able to visualize. It continues down. The basilar artery covers the brainstem like we talked about and 
it doesn't have them now, but it usually has these branches coming off of it, right, laterally that cover the pons called the pontine arteries, and eventually it goes down and turns into the vertebral arteries, right? Again, they're feeding up from the heart, the subclavian artery. Now that we have this, we're going to actually move on to the next step. That's creating our cerebral arteries. So what I'm going to do is first create our anterior cerebral artery. Now the anterior one is pretty simple. You just take one pipe cleaner, you can insert it through and just twist it around a couple times just to make it stable, stationary. Now, if you remember the anterior cerebral artery, this is where I'd ask you if you were in person, what does it feed? What does it supply? Well, if you remember, and I can show you actually on the brain model we have here. What it's going to do is it's going to go up and eventually feed these medial aspects of the brain, right? So most of the frontal lobe, the medial aspect of it at least, and, as, and the anterior portion of the parietal lobe. So that's for the first one. That's your anterior cerebral artery. Okay, so this is where we're at. Next, what you're gonna do is create the middle cerebral artery. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take one of these pipe cleaners and cut them in half. The middle cerebral artery, it supplies most of the lateral aspects of the brain. Now, I'm telling you this, but what I'm doing is I'm taking each one that I cut and just wrapping it around the lateral aspect of the circle. So the anterior one on the top, this middle cerebral artery goes on the lateral aspect. So I'm going to do that to both sides with both halves of the pipe cleaner that I cut. Okay. Once that's done, again, I'll just show you here. Excuse me. I just take this, this is the middle cerebral artery, right? I show you, right? It's feeding the lateral aspects of the brain, much of the, and of course, they're going to have branches that expand and cover most of the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe. Okay. Now, the final cerebral artery is going to be our posterior cerebral artery. So, how I'm going to do that is I'm just going to take one pipe cleaner and like I created the anterior cerebral artery, I'm just going to feed it at the bottom of the circle of the list. So fit it through and just wrap it around a couple times so that it's stable, stationary. Okay. So just like that. So now I have my anterior middle right these purple ones and finally the posterior cerebral artery now the posterior cerebral artery wraps around and it's going to feed much of what is the inferior aspect of your temporal lobe as well as the occipital lobe that's what it looks like here now I have my cerebral arteries done. Now what we're going to do is go downward and we're going to approach the cerebellar arteries. So first cerebrum, now cerebellum. What I'm going to do is first I'm going to make my superior cerebellar artery. And what part of the brain does that actually feed? That is the superior aspect of your cerebellum. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one pipe cleaner and I'm just going to cut it in half. Right now I have two pipe cleaners. I'm just going to take one, wrap it around just at the base of the circle. So below my posterior cerebral artery, I'm going to put my superior cerebellar artery. It's going to wrap that around. So another way of saying where I put it, it's at the very superior aspect of the basilar artery. So that's there. Right? See, it looks like arms on a little stick figure, right? So that's going to feed the superior cerebellum. Next, with my other pipe cleaner that I cut, right, second half, I'm just going to take that and put that at the base of the basilar artery. And that's going to be my anterior, inferior, cerebellar 
artery. So that's feeding much of the inferior aspect of the cerebellum, but the anterior inferior portion. So if I could take cerebellum here. Let's take this out. Then this is our cerebellum. Our superior aspect would be fed by the superior cerebellar artery, which is what's at top. But the inferior anterior cerebellar artery would feed this inferior, but anterior, so closer to the front of the brain, part of the cerebellum. So finally, once you have that in place, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna take our last pipe cleaner, and you can cut this in half as well, and we're gonna create our two posterior inferior cerebellar arteries and they're special they're pretty unique and this is something that you need to remember about them uh, the fact that they actually don't come off of the basilar artery they don't come off of the circle of willis of course right they come off of the vertebral arteries so if you remember the vertebral arteries are what feed into the basilar artery off of the vertebral arteries come these anterior, I mean, posterior, inferior, cerebellar arteries, right? And on an exam, we want you to definitely write out these names that I'm telling you, that I've been telling you. So we don't want to see SCA, PICA, AICA. We want you to be able to spell them all out for us. So remember, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery comes off the vertebral arteries. And this feeds most of the, you guessed it, the posterior inferior cerebellum. So pretty easy to remember. The names are pretty self-explanatory. It's just a matter of you remembering exactly where they come off of, what's considered part of the circle of Willis and what's not. And with that, you have your little pipe cleaner circle of Willis model that you can use whenever you want. And you're good to go. So with that, that's the conclusion of this lab. Thank you very much. And hopefully you and your new stick figure have a great day.